Where were you born and in what year? I was born in Anaskal in the Jingle Peninsula in the year 1928. What area in the parish did you grow up in? In the railway station. My father was station master on the railway, so it was there I grew up. Do you know where your area got its name from? On Skoll, the river of the shadows. Or it could be the river where the heroes were, on Skoll. Now, you arrived into Cashel as a teacher. What was Cashel like when you arrived? Uh, I arrived in uh, August 1949, and 49 into the 50s was a, a time of depression. Now, I re this would be my third depression that I remember. Into the 50s, we had it again in the 80s, and now we have the economic depression again. But casual was very, very poor altogether when I came here. And were it not for immigration, people would have been in an awful way. Um, how did you find out about things that were happening in other places in Ireland and in the rest of the world? Was it all newspapers? or radio? All newspapers and the start of the radio. And when I was about... 12 or 13 radios were becoming popular and the radio had to have a radio you had to have a dry battery and a wet battery and coming on to the mattress and so on we'd be trying to save the batteries <laughs> we wouldn't be allowed to listen to anything and it just shows you uh, in our own home, not everybody had the wireless, it cost money, you see. But in our home, we had the wireless, and I remember for some big hurling match or something like that, uh, oh, the window, the, a big window on the kitchen being taken out altogether, and the whole lot of the kitchen was seated. And a lot of the people from that part of the village had come up to the railway station and they were all seated down inside. <laughs> it was like a theatre. And there was a gang outside looking in the window, listening, listening, listening to the match. So that will tell you how it, it was the start of radio becoming popular. Now, an amazing thing. Mr. John F. Rogers, who taught over in the school before my time, he was dead when I came here, he sang in 2RN, which was the precursor of Radio AM. And in the minute book of the INTO here, uh, he's congratulated on his wonderful rendition of Irish airs that they had listened to on 2RN. This would be before Radio Airn. No, it's just, what is it now, TV2 and TV1 and all this. Um, when, when did you get television in Cashel? No, as regards exactly the years, I couldn't tell you, but the first televisions in Cashel again were by the people who could afford them. And this had been the 60s. And I hadn't, we hadn't a television for a good few years after getting married. We couldn't afford it. At that time, we'd like, I mean, we were blessed to be able to afford an electric cooker, and a washing machine. Now, they were the two great things to, as a young married couple. But our neighbour uh, in Miss Corby's there in, in up Bohorka, it's for sale now. And she had plenty of money, and she had a big mast. I suppose it was 70 or 80 feet 
erected on her roof and she was able to pick up uh, the television uh, uh, signals and she invited all the neighbours for the opening of RTE television. I wasn't at it but I remember my wife being invited and she gave them a high high tea that night up in up in that place in forty seven. I always hear Cashel was no more. Number two, the butlers took over the Archbishop and the Archbishop was no longer Archbishop of Cashel and living in Cashel or living around Cashel where he could hide and where he could any of his letters to Rome and so on from my abode that was where he had met. But he, the butlers of Tudless uh, took him under their wing as you may say and that was a lift up for Tudless, down for Cashel. The coming of the railways, uh, Cashel failed to get. Uh, it was proposed first that Cashel, uh, the line would run Dublin Cashel, and it didn't happen. And Cashel was going down, down, down. Now, you say, when did it, it I, I was explaining the way it got the lift up, even in depressed times in the 50s, it was lifting, lifting, lifting. Now, and tourism started then. When I started teaching first, uh, there was no such thing as getting an apartment or a flat. You went into lodgings and I gave three quarters of my pay to the landlady who provided me with full meals and bedding and all that. Now, the next thing then was, as things were getting better, uh, cattle was improving, improving, improving. The Urban Council were building more houses through government help, government agencies, and you, they developed all uh, Dominic Street up around there, all the way up towards the rock, and tourism started getting that great lift. Buses started coming. Now the railway, unfortunately, we got the branch line here in 1904 through the efforts of the Dean and politicians didn't do much for it. But uh, he was instrumental in getting the railway and it only lasted 15 years. The railway took you nowhere. It was only a little, a little siding, as you may say. And I regret to this day that it closed on because it would have been such a great draw even four or five times a year to bring in excursions from other areas, although cars now are providing the transport. But when I came here, I'd say if he had a hundred tours, a week up in the rock. Joe Minogue was the caretaker. And always after school in the evening, if the weather was very fine, and I lived down at the end of the town, I always went for a walk up to the rock. And I spent all my nice summer evenings, or autumn evenings, up on the rock itself. And I must have taken the thousand people around gave them guided tours of the rock myself <laughs> and on a good few occasions I was handed a hansel <laughs> by a yank <laughs> thanking me for 
<laughs> I didn't want it at all. I, I, I prefer the stage. But poor Joe wasn't maybe around when they'd ask, was there anyone to take them around and show them? <laughs> but, and now, at that time, the rock, there were sods of grass growing on the top of Cormac's chapel. There were sods, I saw the sods growing there. A friend of my own, who was a teacher, Pat Hartnett, and Pat, the poor fella, he had a nervous breakdown, and Pat had to give up the teaching. He wasn't able to manage the class. But again, he was unfortunate, I think, that it was in a very depressed part of Dublin that he was teaching in. And he was, as you may say, he jumped from the frying pan into the fire. Couldn't, so he gave up the teaching altogether and he did archaeology. And in his archaeology, he went down through all France. And uh, in France, they were starting to light up the great chateaus and they were doing a program called Sonnet Lumiere. And he continued down through France, Italy, across, and into Greece. And they were just after floodlighting the Acropolis in Greece. You know this from all the pictures of it with the big pillars. And he said, God, wouldn't it be great if the Rock of Cashel was flublish. And now, yet this fellow had great political connections to Fianna Fáil. And he landed a job with Board Falter as their first archaeological expert. And was up and down, he's from Kilbrain outside Kentork in North Cork. And you get out this where he's from, there's a casual connection. Because when Taff and his army left here in 1647 and left the town open to Murrah O'Brien and uh, two years after to Cromwell's army, he retired to down there and it was he gave battle in Knuck na Nos. Knuck na Nos. The little hill of the bones of the. But he was up and down then, and he said to one of his, one of his brothers who was a, a De La Salle teacher, Do you ever walk past through Cashel? Why don't you call to see my great friend John Knightley there? I didn't know this Pat Hartnett at all. And the next thing is Pat started calling to me. I lived below on board at the time. And he said, I have been to the Urban Council and they have no money to light the rock. I could give them the capital for the right light for the installation, but not for the running of it. The Office of Public Works or PW who runs the rock. They have no money to do it. The urban council couldn't do it. I've been to the county council. They couldn't do it. He said, this is the second year that I have this in my budget, he said. I think it was 27,000 pounds or something for putting in all the cables and so on around the rock. And he said, if you try to form some committee, maybe you'd be able to get it going. And we started a committee and got the rock flooded. And again, it drew attention to the rock and it helped. It helped, I must say. Even though we were criticised for doing it. And subsequent to that, a friend of mine, another teacher, Stuck in the Rose of Tralee festival down there, 
and he was passing through town and he called to see me and he said, hey, he said, <coughs> he had seen the rocket castle for a bridge sometime when he was passing through at night time. And he said, try Guinnesses, they give you sponsorship. And it took me, I'd say a fortnight, to compose the special letter to Guinnesses uh, looking for sponsorship. And we got it for we got it for fifteen or twenty years. And they paid for all the the consumption of the light. And the next thing then was the fixtures the same as camera work, the change had come in lighting and you were no longer these big bulbs, the, the bulbs that were in use above the rock that in were as big as a bucket, big, big, huge bulbs. And uh, there was all this new type of filament lighting and everything and it had to be renewed. So as a committee we said, no, we'll things have improved and the border works took over the flood lighting of the rock. So they're flood lighting it since. Um, do you have any final words for the people who will be watching this recording? One other thing that I remember because I met a man down the street there only one day last week and he said, how are you? He said, God, he said, the way we look forward to uh, our day in Clane. We're only 47 miles from the sea here. And when I came here, there was, I suppose, 50% of the population had never seen the sea. Because don't forget now, we had no channels down to the sea here. It was to Dublin, though, train to take you from 50 to 54, or not 4 to 54. So, a lady here gave the Vincent de Paul in 1950, she gave us 50 pounds, and she said, I'd like if he took the children, some of the poor children, to the sea for a day. And imagine, we kept doing that for 21 years and some of the women and men around the town they'd say, God I remember that, it was the day we look forward to, a day at the sea and imagine in our 21 years we had only one wet day and we provided them with tea sandwiches everything. And as you may say, the 50 pounds stretched out and out and out, but it was the Vincent de Paul and we had a special collection every year for it. But some of the, and recently there, I was sympathizing with three women, three sisters, and I said, <laughs> Some of these know like I mean I'd be familiar with them and I said, How are the three sisters? God I said, I, I missed your other sister's funeral. Ah sure. That was to be expected, Mr. Knightley. But you were great on the radio there last week. I wasn't on any radio last week. You were all about the children's outing. I said I wasn't. That's years ago I said that I was on the radio doing that. She said. That was years ago. A program that I did and that had been recorded. <laughs> and David had found it and she said she'll produce this again. 